I'm going to talk to you about what not to say to someone who is depressed or anxious. I know because I do have a family member who is anxious. I have people that are depressed and uh, I found myself saying all the things at different times that I'm not supposed to say. And I've had to learn to say what I need to say. And sometimes I have to go back and remind myself because it's really easy when you don't struggle with anxiety or depression to not re recognize that people that do struggle with that, they can't do the things that you can and that I can. They don't have the abilities and they're struggling against very powerful forces of depression and anxiety. So it's not easy for them. They, they're, they don't have the same skills and the same resources that we have. So the first one is that we don't say is snap out of it or stop feeling that way or don't give into it. When we say that, we minimize it. Just, oh, snap out of it. Oh, don't give into it. Oh, that is not a possibility when you're struggling with deep depression or severe anxiety snapping out of it, not going to happen. They can't snap out of it. They can't not give into it. It's there. It's, they would love to not give into it. They would love to snap out of it. They would love to just stop feeling that way. That is impossible. Next one is thinking that you can be empathetic by saying, oh, I get depressed or anxious too. No, once in a while, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of depression, that is not the same thing. Again, that minimizes it. That's saying, oh, I do that once in a while. Oh, I get it. No, you don't get it, okay? You don't get it if you don't have severe depression or severe anxiety. Even if you've been a little depressed once in a while or a little anxious, you have no clue. Next one, there's always someone worse off. That doesn't help because that's saying to this person, yours isn't so bad. But in reality, theirs is probably pretty bad. If you're dealing with somebody whose anxiety is keeping them from a normal life or whose depression is inter interfering with them living a normal life, no. For them, they need to have you empathize and understand and validate that for them, it's really bad. Next one. Just think of something positive. Again, if that were possible, they would have already done it. They would do it because if they could just think of something positive like you, they'd be done. They wouldn't be in this situation. Next one, this is really empathetic, not empathetic. You're crazy, you're nuts, you're just weak. Okay, that's really mean and really bad, but sometimes people do that, not understanding mental illness, that it's a real thing and that it really matters. So no, that's not good enough. So you can't say that, that's horrible. Don't even go there. Don't even think it so that it doesn't come out of your mouth. Now here's the Christian comments that are what you don't wanna say. First one, Misunderstanding of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God won't give you more than you can bear. That scripture says, God won't give you more than you can bear, but will, with the temptation, provide a way out. That scripture is not about what you can't bear. It's that God's not going to tempt you or allow you to be tempted without giving you resources to stand up against the temptation. That's not about having not having hard things in your life. Trust me, I know people that have more than they can bear in their life. And yes, all of us meet the challenge that we have to, but man, these are overwhelming circumstances. And, and I don't think that that scripture means that they're not going to have more than they can actually hold up under. Because, you know, sometimes people get more than they can handle. Sometimes they crack, okay? Sometimes they just crumble. So don't say that. Don't say God won't give you more than you can bear because that makes them feel bad. Like what's wrong with me that I'm not bearing this? What's wrong with me that I'm giving into the temptation of 
anxiety or depression. Again, that's not what, it's not a temptation. It's a mind set that comes from having neurotransmitter chemicals in their brain that are off, that are out of balance, that are causing real symptoms. Like think of it as a brain disease. Think of it as the sugar diabetes of the brain, that insulin isn't off, the neurochemicals are off that are causing the anxiety or the depression. The next one, God will work your suffering for good. That's Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him, for their good and his glory. Oh, stop, okay? This does not feel like it's for good. Yes, God can work anything out for good and use it for a good purpose, and he does. And that's what's so cool about having God in your life and trusting him with things. But that does not make you feel better when you're going through real problems. That makes you feel worse. So don't say that. Next one, let's rebuke the spirit of depression. You know, in the Bible, when Jesus was walking on earth, there was a lot of demon possession and oppression. And Jesus rebuked spirits to come out of people who were obviously mentally ill, throwing themselves down, who were doing things that were could be described as mental illness. But in a society like ours, where it, in the Western world, where we don't do a lot of spirit worship and we don't do a lot of stuff people aren't you know actively involved with things that have to do with demonology and there's no we're not you know worshiping other gods where we're opening ourselves up to the kind of spirit a lot of times almost all the time it's not a spirit that's oppressing us or possessing us it really is a chemical condition or it's caused by circumstances that happen to us, things that happen in our life that we have to work through, or thoughts that are actually wrong, maybe all of those combinations together. But it's a real thing. And by saying, let's just rebuke that spirit, the thing I don't like about that is it sends people down the wrong path. It tells them that I'm being oppressed or, or possessed, and then it means I have to go for prayer. And that's great. Go pray, pray for somebody with that. If that's what it is, God, take it away. But don't minimize the fact that they need real help. Probably need to see a psychiatrist or someone that would give them medication and a therapist that would help them because otherwise you're going to keep them stuck even longer. Next one, Christians shouldn't be depressed. We should have God's joy. That's telling people that there is no room for depression or anxiety for Christians. And that's not true either because it has nothing to do with whether we're saved or not. We're saved, we're trusting God for our salvation, but there's situations that have happened in your life that have led to depression or anxiety. Anxiety, a lot of it can be gotten worse by learned responses and by associating certain things with anxiety and then your brain sees it and pulls up the anxiety because it's a triggered response and or you have PTSD from trauma that's happening to you, happened to you in the past. I mean, if we say, we say that we shouldn't be depressed or shouldn't be anxious as Christians because we have joy, we are minimizing people and we're condemning them. And that is sad and it doesn't help them, it doesn't help them get better and it doesn't help them get help. Next one, let's pray God heals you. This offers a false hope of an instant cure. Depression and anxiety are not typically instantly cured or instantly healed by God. They take work. They take uh, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication, other types of medication. They take Therapy, God doesn't usually instantly change brain cells and change those neurochemicals. And I mean, usually, so by saying that to somebody, when you say, let's pray God instantly heals you, again, you direct their attention onto an instant healing. That does not help them. It makes them feel worse. So what could you say to someone who is depressed or anxious? You say, I don't know what it's like going through this, 
but it must be really hard. That's super empathetic. How about this one? What can I do? How can I help you? Very open-minded, very supportive. You aren't alone. I'm here for you for the long haul and then be there. And let me tr tell me, tell you, trust me, it's a long haul when you're with somebody who has mental illness and severe depression or anxiety. You're not going crazy, it's real. It's real, how validating is that? Don't worry about me, I can take care of myself. People that are depressed and anxious and you're supporting them or a caregiver for them, they worry that they are uh, you know, bothering you and taking too much of your life and you need to say, I'm okay. You don't have to worry about me. I can take care of myself. I'm fine. Okay, so assure them. And then the last one, here are some helpful resources. So maybe direct them toward therapy. Help them find a therapist. Help them find somebody that would actually uh, help them, give them a organization, a support group, drive them to therapy, pay for therapy, take them to the doctor, make a doctor's appointment where they can actually get some medication, get some help, help them find a doctor. All those types of things are really, really helpful. So I hope that this has helped you understand depression and anxiety a little bit better and recognize that there are some things that really will hurt the person and there are some things that will really help the person. So thank you for watching this video on Change My Relationship. All right, thank you.